OK, everyone, this lesson is all about the golden age of Elizabeth. So this is the next um, topic that we're going to be looking at and we're going to be finding out about the Elizabethan golden age. Um, we're going to be learning um, all about the theatre in the time of Elizabeth. We're going to learn about exploration um, and we're also going to be learning about how the poor were treated during this time. So many people um, in Elizabethan England would refer to it as a golden age for England. Elizabeth knows the Virgin Queen and sometimes referred to as Gloriana. Um, and we're going to think about um, some of the culture that that took place during the time of Queen Elizabeth I. So maybe write down some ideas. What do you think we might mean by a golden age, a golden age? So in this lesson, we're thinking about the golden age. We're going to look at Elizabethan society and what's called the English Renaissance. We're going to find out about the growth of the gentry and how they showed off their wealth. And then we're obviously going to review um, that learning. So pause this any time if you need to go back over something. Um, but we're going to talk about some of the key things that made the Elizabethan era a golden age for England. So this shows you a picture of what's called the Bankside area of Elizabeth Elizabethan England, drawn by Wenceslas Holler. And this shows you some of the theatres that you can see here. So the Globe Theatre, for example, um, stands out here. And this area was an area full of culture um, and quite an interesting area, particularly towards the middle and end of Elizabeth reign. So the first thing to be aware of is that Elizabethan society was really highly structured. And there's a concept for you to be aware of called the Great Chain of Being. And this basically shows you the different levels in society. Um, so obviously you've got, you know, the church at the top there, but then Elizabeth as, as head of the church is, is very, very important. Then you've got the nobility and um, the gentry. Now, the, the nobility are the people that, you know, inherited their titles um, and they were often traditionally being the great families of England. But in the Tudor times, those great Previously, great families had seen their power reduce um, and the power of the gentry had become more important. So these were wealthy landowners, perhaps very wealthy merchants, people that had risen up and made their fortunes. And they had become very important within Elizabeth's Privy Council and also um, within Parliament as well. Obviously, below that, you've got the peasantry uh, and then the idea below that, you've got sort of like the animals and the plants um, within this whole idea of the great chain of being. So during the time of Elizabeth, England had started to go through an, a renaissance. And one of the key things that had enabled this to happen was the growth of the printing press that allowed more things like books, for example, allowed more ideas to be spread. Things like education, for example, um, was better than it had been um, before. So it's really important that you were aware of that. And that one of the key things is that this new class, the gentry, um, well, not really a new class, but they became more important and um, were very keen during the time to show off their wealth. Now, there's various figures that you will kind of come across during this time. And because um, of the rise of the gentry during this time, there's some key figures around the Renaissance. So there's people like Thomas Tallis, who's a musician, Nicholas Hilliard, who's a famous artist. What's very fashionable in Elizabethan times is to have very miniature portraits. And um, people sometimes wore in things like around uh, necklaces or had very miniature portraits on the wall. Um, there's John Napier, mathematician, William Camden, who's a new type of historian, very much using the same techniques that historians use nowadays with really referencing their sources carefully. You've got scientists like Francis Bacon. You've got William Harvey, who discovers that blood circulates around the body. So we've really got almost like a rebirth of learning, which is going on widely in Europe during this time. But we're seeing this um, rebirth really of culture in England during this time. So the thing that you need to be aware of, and you can have a, a read of this, pause this and read it, is why does the gentry become more important? Well, firstly, um, the Tudors had deliberately sidelined the, the nobility because when Henry VII became the King of England in 1485, he'd seen many of these um, sort of traditional important families in England as a threat to his rule. So he deliberately sidelined some of those families. Then in addition, um, when Henry VIII dissolved the monasteries, that meant that there was more lands to purchase than before. The power of the church had begun to decline. Farming became more efficient, which meant that the gentry class had more money. With that, there was much more trade and exploration. So there's people like Francis Drake, for example, um, that started to travel and, and we had trade with you know, the Americas during this time as well. And that brought um, more wealth and prosperity into England during this time. Um, and the spending of the gentry, they wanted to show off their wealth. So that created a new class of artists, musicians, 
architects, writers, and this led to the sense of a golden age. You know, this is the time of people like Shakespeare, for example, time of people like Christopher Marlowe during this time as well. The other thing for you to be aware of is to know about Elizabethan fashions as well. So another thing that the gentry liked to spend their money on was fashions. And um, you can see here, we won't go through them all, but um, you've got some typical Elizabethan fashion for women there. So the farthingale was a hoot petticoat uh, worn around women's skirt to accentuate the hips. There's the overskirt, which was worn over the petticoat. A bodice, a close fitting garment for the upper body. Um, you've got these things around the collar, which is called a ruff, which is an exaggerated collar made of lace. This sort of jacket is very um, kind of distinctive of the Elizabethan era. Era, um, It's called a doublet. Um, you've got um, a cape, which was, again, very fashionable, worn by most men. And the hose, which is these stockings that most men would wear during this time as well. And this slide just gives you a little bit more of a checklist of some of the different things that they would um, wear. Men would wear hats, cloaks, they would carry swords, they, it would be fashionable to have a beard, for example. Whereas for women, um, they would um, often dye their hair, often have false hair. It's quite fashionable in Elizabethan times to have quite a lot of hair and big hair. Um, so women would often wear false hair and wigs. Um, Elizabeth herself um, wore a wig. Um, they wore heavy white makeup, so it's very fashionable for your face to look very, very pale during that time. Um, the type of makeup they used was quite often lead based and poisonous. Elizabeth herself had very black teeth because she absolutely loved um, sugar. So her teeth were all rotten. Um, so it became fashionable for people to actually blacken their teeth during that time as well. And then a small hat to, to really accentuate how much hair you would be showing off. So, again, people would spend quite a lot of money in Elizabethan, Elizabethan times on fashion. The other thing to be aware of is around architecture as well. So as things became safer during this time and England became a more stable country, um, the sort of noble families and gentry families didn't need to worry so much about defending their houses and making their houses like castles and fortifying their castles. So we had quite a few different changes and this shows you um, a very famous um, house from Elizabethan times called Hardwick Hall which was owned by a lady who was known as Bess of Hardwick and you can see here and you can read that information as well some typical features of Elizabethan architecture so things like the very high straight chimneys for example these little pillars are called loggia um, which are influenced by Italian Renaissance architecture um, having on the top floor this what's called a long gallery which you can see here that would probably stretch across the whole of the front of the building this would be a place where people could take exercise in the winter um, also you would have dances and entertain guests in here you put up your family portraits maybe have a few miniatures on there as well um, so this is the some typical features of Elizabethan architecture floor plans were often e-shaped um, in tribute to Elizabeth as well so I'll just take you through a few um, key homes in um, the Elizabethan era just so you're aware of that in just a moment again there you can pause that and have a look at that some more um, information about Elizabethan architecture there so these are some key features and um, before we look at some houses e-shaped floor plans and um, this is a very distinctive Elizabethan feature you get the timber framed wattle and daub so you get that sort of black and white distinctive pattern feature you get a what are called mullioned win windows where you've got these sort of little lead um, things in the windows here to make sort of distinctive shapes and um, the chimney stacks are very intricate and often quite tall so that again is a big feature of Elizabethan houses you've now got bedrooms on the top floor extensive use of glass there's that long um, gallery that we were talking about before oak panelled walls and um, you've also got the loggia that I spoke about before geometric plaster work um, so lots and lots of features there. Now, one of the most famous architects during the Elizabethan era was called Robert Smithson. Um, he designed Longleat House and then Hardwick Hall, which is pictured here as well, um, and very much influenced by that Italian Renaissance. Um, places like Florence in Italy, very, very influential on the style of architecture that we had in Elizabethan times. So if you have a look at some of the houses, this is Burley House, which was built for William Cecil near Peterborough. So you can see the, those high chimneys and um, you can see um, very, very grand and um, lots of mullioned windows, for example, in that one. That's Longleat House in Derbyshire and um, very, very famous um, Elizabethan house. A little bit of information about Hardwick Hall, who was um, owned by the wealthiest woman in England at the time, Elizabeth, the Countess of Shrewsbury, known as Bess of Hardwick. 
Um, there's another picture of Hardwick Hall. We studied that in, in quite a lot of detail now. Um, Kenilworth Castle. Now, we're going to be learning more about Kenilworth Castle, and um, you're going to need to know about that as a case study. This was a castle which was given to Robert Dudley, the Earl of Leicester, in 1563. And he changed it massively, and he built what was known as what was called Leicester's Building, um, and he built um, a huge sort of new extension to it. Uh, in order to entertain Elizabeth when she came on her progress. Um, and she actually stayed at Kenilworth Castle for 19 days at a very famous um, event in 1575. And Robert Dudley hoped to build this building to impress Elizabeth in the hope that she would marry him. But in the end, um, she decided not to. Uh, poor old uh, Robert Dudley. Um, so a few more pictures there of Kenilworth uh, Castle. There's the gardens there that were built to be very, very impressive. Well worth a visit if you get an opportunity to go. Um, that shows you um, Robert Dudley and Elizabeth when Elizabeth went for her progress around the country and stayed for 19 days at Kenilworth in 1575. This is Speak Hall in Cheshire. So again, we can see that timber framed Watland daub. Very, very distinctive. Very, very nice indeed. And again, that same feature is seen at Little Moreton Hall in Cheshire, um, which you can see there just near um, a place called Congleton, if you know Cheshire. Well, uh, and this is Montacute House in Somerset. Um, so you can get um, a real idea there. And the, the gentry would have these very expensive houses in order to show off their wealth um, during this time. And that's a key feature of this golden age of the Elizabethan era. So the Elizabethan build, this is a source from William Harrison, talked about how everyone seemed to be a builder in Elizabethan times. It created lots of new jobs and opportunities for people um, during this time as well. Um, so there's a few videos that you can watch there. Um, if you can click on them through the PowerPoint to find out a bit more about the culture in the Elizabethan era and about the fashions and the types of houses they had and the English Renaissance as well. So based on this information, this PowerPoint, just make a revision mind map based on that on the Elizabethan Golden Age and just make sure you can understand what we mean by the great chain of being, what we mean by the rise of the gentry, who are the key Renaissance individuals, Elizabethan fashion and then Elizabethan architecture and try and have some specific examples of some of those different Elizabethan buildings. So if you think about things like Speak Hall and Hardwick House, for example, and Kenilworth Castle, you know, and who owned them, then that would be absolutely great. So that's the key things we've learned about in this lesson. England is going through a renaissance during this time. Elizabethan society is very hierarchical with the great chain of being. The gentry spent their money showing off their wealth. They did that through fashion or what the houses look like. And there's some examples of some of the famous Elizabethan houses. So thanks very much for listening. Um, and um, if you've got any questions, then please do let me know. Thank you.